Alrighty, welcome everyone. I'm Tiabu and I am here for Legend of Vox Machina episode 6. Happy Friday all and everyone. Uh, hopefully today is going to be a really good day for all of you. It's so far a pretty good day for me. It is morning, which is better than my, my usual scheduling. Um, <laughs> I'm actually awake. Uh, speaking of which, I have been posting pretty much every day um, whatever I do to try to wake up in the morning on my Instagram. Uh, so you can find a story of me uh, uh, going like this uh, for a couple of seconds because that's what I did this morning to try to wake up. It works really well. It forces me to move. I did not want to get out of bed today and that got my blood flowing and got me going. So big thumbs up there. Nice. As well as, of course, eating beef jerky for breakfast, which is the bomb. Anyway. You can go and find out all that stuff on my Instagram. It's Tiabu YouTube. Go follow me. Thank you. We're here for Legend of Vox Machina. We got some comments to talk about because some stuff went down, but not that many, just a couple. And then we'll talk about the stuff that went down. First off, I want to talk about some comments from a little throwback to episode four. L. Schnitzer writes, good comment. God damn it, El Schnitzer, you broke my system. Fuck you. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Good job. Good job. You broke my system. Well done. Um, there's a cool comment by Mercure250 that is interesting, but it's a response to my own comment, uh, to his comment or their comment. It was like this. And and so you can go and read that on your own. I'm not gonna read it out. Okay. Um, Triple A Andrew, Triple A Andrew writes, I believe Matt said they were wraiths, and Jarrett was made into a captain for this show. That makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. Um, Jeffrey Meehan writes, the scene between Pike and Grog at the Keep, while incredibly touching and great for developing both their characters and the relationship between them, also does some very important world building. Up to now, Pike's powers, their source, and the role her pendant plays in it hasn't really been touched on. In fact, a number of other reactors who aren't familiar with Critical Role or D&D were of the opinion that her powers came directly from the pendant and that the pendant itself might be called Everlight, or that the Everlight might be some sort of spirit that inhabits the pendant. pendant. By having Grog pick up her pendant and say, is this the thing that lets you talk to your goddess? It answers a a lot of questions and leads to a conversation that answers and clarifies even more. It's a really clever way of layering it and world building along with some very strong characterization and character development. I want to call it show don't tell because of how subtle and seamless it seems, but well, Grog literally says it. Still, I think it hits the same vein because the scene isn't just there to explain something to the audience. Yeah, it's definitely a multi-purpose, multifaceted, multifunctional scene, and it works really well. Um, I tend to forget about this, and it's something that, that like, doesn't get brought up in, in the discourse uh, as often as maybe it, it might or should. But um, religion is a fundamental tenet of Dungeons and Dragons. It's like it's really hard to run a Dungeons and Dragons campaign without there being gods that actually really exist in your world. Now, they're analog, and and are they analogous in any way to real world religions? No, there are ways that you can play it and have like the the Norse or Greek pantheons be part of your god system, and that's totally viable, and you can do that. But usually, they're made up fantasy gods, and they have made up fantasy domains that they inhabit and like made up fantasy stuff that they deal with made up fantasy portfolios that they take care of and they're they're gods it's what they do but it's like it's part and parcel to the world it is not possible to have clerics without having deities it it's not it's part of the thing technically i guess you could have like some kind of a homebrew system campaign where your clerics are are bound to ideals and those ideals are never manifested in like the form of big bearded men or women in the sky bearded women in the sky the dwarven goddesses hell yeah let's go uh, or i guess they would be under the mountain they wouldn't be in the sky fuck this guy the doors don't care about the sky um but it's not possible to dnd without gods it's an important fundamental tenet of the world it's like the idea that the world is old and yet all of the things that are old about it are like ruined and lost that's a fundamental tenet of the way that dnd works and if you take it out everything else stops working properly because all of the ideas of like artifacts and items of lore and the deep history of the world all of these things sort of evaporate um Obviously, you can play in isolation in, like, small settings or one-shots or things like that without worrying about any of this stuff, and it's not that hard. But once you start playing for a couple, more than a couple of, of, of times, a couple of sessions, you run up against these fundamental questions like, okay, where are these cool magic items that we're getting coming from, and can people make them now? That's an important question to ask. In some settings, yes. In some settings, no. In some settings, they're the ancient, like, items and artifacts of a long-dead civilization. In some settings, they're that, and we're trying to manu ma manufacture them now in the present. In some settings, we make robots because it's Eberron. What's up? Let's go. Um, it's crazy, but it's really important to mention that, yeah, they'll, there's, there are gods. They are real. When Pike is talking about the Everlight and when Grog is talking about the Everlight, that's 
a goddess who's a real fucking goddess who's really out there somewhere and really might talk to Pike at some point. And when Pike heals people or glows up or does stuff, that's her genuinely and directly manifesting the powers of a deity. That's clerics. That's what they do. It's fucking sick. Honestly, it's super cool. Um, but it's something that maybe you don't know going into D&D. You're like, fantasy. It's a fantasy. But in the same way that, like, none of Lord of the Rings is Lord of the Rings unless there's the actual background of all of the, the, the oh, fuck, I'm not gonna, all the names of the people and the Melkor and the bad guys and the good guys and the, the gods and the angels and the not angels and the fallen angels and the devils and the, all the shit, right? All that shit, you don't necessarily need to know it to understand the story of, I want to take the ring to the mountain, and uh, you, okay, you understand the story, but like the background of it, why Sauron do Sauron things, you gotta answer that, and there's an answer for it that comes from that, back, that background and that history and that broader scale of the universe and that sort of metaphysical perspective, which is pretty cool. Um, moving on. Also, Jeffrey Meehan. Jeffrey Meehan coming out hard with some comments. I think this encounter was based on when the Briarwoods attempted to silence Desmond by sending an invisible stalker. Uh, I think that's the spell. It's not a spell. It's actually a creature, but um, it's the same idea. You summon one, and it's a creature, and it, it goes and does a thing to assassinate him while Vox Machina was interrogating him at their keep. They had much more clout in the campaign, and thus were able to keep Desmond as a prisoner for interrogation. Because they don't have that clout, and no one in their right mind would let a witness who was almost killed be in the custody of a group that includes the men that almost killed them, they decided to have Vax... Ha 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 uh, to have Vax take and keep the book in episode 3, and have that be the excuse for why Delilah sends creepy and incor corporeal assassins into their home. I really like the use of race, as it leans hard into Delilah's aesthetic as a necromancer. Oh yeah, um, hard agree with everything that you said here, this makes sense, and I, I went back and I was like, yeah, wait, what? Oh yeah, they did try to assassinate him, because they were keeping him in their keep, in their, like, their oubliette, in their, like, jail cell, and then got assassinated. And I think he got assassinated when Jarrett and a couple of other people, when, like, their normie house guards were around, and they didn't do well. Um, but it ended up being a fun fight and an interesting thing, and, and, and interesting and cool. But there were also, there are like, a lot of differences between the way that this played out and the way that that played out. I mean, we had a guest in the real campaign, uh, What's-Her-Face, who played the tiefling, which, with the broker, and none of that ever came back or was in any way relevant. It's like, blah, blah, blah. Um... Oh, that, that wasn't here, was it? That was somewhere else. No, that wasn't something else. That was in Crimson Diplomacy. Yeah. After the, the fight with the Briarwoods, we had Lilith, this random white tiefling who was pretending to be a serving girl in Sovereign Uriel's palace, who then pops out and reveals herself and, and helps them during the fight. And then there's an old woman, and then there's the, the crawl or the crawl or whatever in the throw of the thing. And also, we... Yeah, we totally skip over the blam, 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 like all the all the things that happen with all that stuff. There's like a lot of stuff that happens there. And also, the reason that they got pissed at, at Vox Machina was because of the old lady that Tibbs killed, right? Oh my god. So many things they had to change just to work around all the changes that have happened, and it, it's reasonable to do so. I don't have a problem with it, but hmm, it does make sense now. It does make sense now. Okay, I'm going to move on from this set of comments. I will say that Bill DeWitt, uh, oh no, I already talked about Bill DeWitt in the last time. Great. Bill DeWitt, in the new one, uh, in, in the latest video, writes good stuff. Again, the action sequence is really good and goes, goes on to, uh, talk about a bunch of stuff. I'm going to skip through. It feels very gothic horror-y, almost Lovecraftian. Super agree. It's so great. It's, it's solid. The foggy forest feels ominous and spooky and the dilapidated white stone is appropriately off-putting, as it should be. Thoughts on the characters haven't changned that much, um, but they're pulling off the ed edgelord in the lighthearted party with, like, Vax and stuff, um, but more importantly, like, with Percy and stuff. He's the edgelord right now. Uh, my only issue is that they spoke about the Sun Tree immediately before arriving to see how it is now, which kind of made it feel forced, it, like it was just dropped in to try and make the scene more impactful. I feel like it would have been better to have those flashbacks about the tree in the city in general, either last episode or the start of the journey this episode, or maybe have the current tree reveal first, then talk about the backstory. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think, I think maybe it's just you. Um, I do agree that there's, like, it's a little close and it's a little bit obvious and maybe ham-fisted in its juxtaposition because we talk about, oh, the beauty of the sun tree and then we come over the hill and we see the sun tree and it's all fucked. But it's, like, I don't know how I would do it better. It's hard to do it better. I'm fine with it. Um, I think maybe what I would have liked here is during the conversations with, like, Keyleth 
and Percy in his workshop in the last episode, in the previous episode, if he brings up the sun tree. I think there's a, a really easy way that we can do that is if we have Keyleth bring up something like, because we had this back and forth where she tried to share something about herself to get him to open up and share something about himself. But if she had shared something that had been relevant to like a tree or nature or life or something like that, and Percy had just been like, ah, I vibe with that because big tree in my hometown that was like an important part of my childhood, we would have had that set up in a more organic sense earlier and then it wouldn't feel so forced and that could work. But it still works. I'm okay with it. Um, glad your dragon fight went well. I'm going to talk about D&D again. It'll be less relevant than last, last week's rambling. I just want to talk about cool things for my TTRPG experiences. Thank you for the well wishes on the dragon fight. It did go well. It's great. Um, and I'm going to continue with you. Uh, when I DM a story with horror themes, as are present in this show, I like to include some sanity mechanics, often inspired by other people's homebrew or lifted straight from the uh, from other games like the Call of Cthulhu TTRPG. TTTRPG? TTTRPG. One of my favorites was a recent one-shot where I took inspiration from a game called Dread. I love Dread. Um, there's a really great Dread one-shot run by, fuck, it's Mr. Mutton Chops. He's got Mutton Chops. He's really good at running horror games, um, and it's on Geek and Sundry. Geek and Sundry Horror Dread. Uh, it's just a camping trip. Sagas of Sundry. This is the one. Who's the guy? Who that boy? Is he listed in the thing? Ivan Van Norman, who is fantastic. Um, the cast of that one is really amazing. It's Matthew Mercer, Satine Phoenix, Amy Vorpal, Talison Jaffe, and Amy Dallin. And, or Dallin, I, I actually don't know. Um, it's stellar. It's, it's really good. The way that they did a sanity mechanic was with Jenga. Um, yep, and I just got through to your comment. I took inspiration from a game called Dread. Whenever someone lost sanity, they had to pull from a Jenga tower, and if they knocked it over, they gained an insanity condition like paranoia, bibliomania, or nyctophobia. It was great for building tension as the tower got less stable. The insanities were great for encouraging my players to roleplay the fear of their characters, and it's a super simple mechanic that players can understand and engage with almost immediately. I would recommend for anyone trying to run a high horror one-shot, though it only works in person, of course, because digital Jenga would be whack, right? Like, duh. Okay. Hard, super, mega agree. First off, if you want to homebrew stuff into your setting or into your campaign to make things work, fucking do it. Dungeons & Dragons 5e is not necessarily a one-fits-all, all-tools-in-a-toolbox system for running everything that you want. Check out GURPS, check out for, for Forgotten Lands, for Forbidden Lands, Deadlands, whatever it is. Um, there are a bunch of fucking different t t TTRPGs, and there are new ones coming out every day because people care about this stuff and they're trying to become game designers and make their own de games. And they're good, and there are people playing them, and some of them are really cool. Um, Dread and Call of Cthulhu are up there in the, like, well-known good stuff category. Uh, GURPS is the real one-size-fits-all toolbox for everything, but of course, as a one-size-fits-all toolbox, it makes things harder. You could always use the Cypher system for cool stuff if you want to use Cyphers. That makes things a lot easier on the DMing side. There's Mothership um, for a totally different thing to run, like, alien-inspired one-shots and stuff. It's super cool. There is a lot of TTRBG stuff in the world, and my recommendation to you is... Find the stuff you like about it and steal it. Just like when you watch campaigns or watch D&D shows or watch TV or watch anime or watch whatever, take whatever you want and steal it. You like that character who's a villain and you like their 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 whole story and the way that they go about being a villain? Steal them. You like that uh, that reveal where the party, like, you know, you know, the main character walks into a room and the bad guy has, like, the, the main character's nephew on a pedestal and is about to stab him to death? Fucking steal it. Um, you like that big battle sequence from Lord of the Rings where the big army charges into the other big army? Narrate it. Don't, don't try to run it as combat. It won't work. Um, it won't work. Just, just narrate it and, and narrate it happening and you're good. Uh, but still steal it. Fucking steal the shit out of it. You want to give somebody a sword that glows when orcs are around and call it Sting? Steal it. Do it. You want to give them a ring that's all powerful and makes them invisible but it lets evil things see them? Fucking cool idea. Steal it. Steal it all. And you want to take a, a cool system, a cool mechanic from a game that you like and put it into a different game that you like? Guess what I'm going to say? Fucking do it. Steal it. Do it. Get it done. Yeah. Cool things plus more cool things sometimes equal really cool things. So do that a lot. Um, I'm glad you've enjoyed using Lifted or other people's homebrew for your own reasons. It's a good idea. You should do that. It's great. I, I, that's all I got to say. Good job. Okay. 
on to the last comment of our comment section, I promise. Uh, this one comes from Bestial Moon. Hi, Bestial. Uh, I believe I mentioned it before, but I'm pretty blind to Vox Machina's story, so when the party got to the sun tree and found the bodies dressed like them dangling from the tree, I legitimately got a chill up my spine. Ooh! Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. The sound design in the credits really helps to send it home. Fuck yeah. Um, all of season one is out now, and it was so good. I'd go and start watching campaign one, but they did say there are 12 more episodes coming later in another season. I want to save myself for more experiences like this. So I'll probably watch the Mighty Nine and the last few eps of D20 if that I have left in the meantime. I really think you're going to like the rest of the show, especially based on how you've been feeling about these last few eps. Oh, I think so. I think I agree with you. Um, yeah, go watch Mighty Nine. It's got its own crazy. It's got its own whole whole brand of crazy, and it's very different. I will say that to some extent, and you can consider this spoilers if you want, but it's not really. It, it really isn't. I won't go into spoiler territory. It's just like maybe you don't want to know this, uh, anything at all about uh, Mighty Nine, but I'm just going to tell you something. I view the Mighty Nine campaign as in many ways a direct response to the Vox Machina campaign, which makes a lot of sense, right? I think that a lot of the characters made characters the way that they made their characters in a direct response to the characters that they played before in order to play somebody completely different. And I think it works really well, um, except for Liam, who also still wants to play a sad boy. But, you know, he plays a very different sad boy, and that's okay. Uh, I have no problems with that. His, his Mighty Nine character is great, and lots of people like him, and I like him too. Um, but there are, despite there not being necessarily huge spoilers in Mighty Nine for Vox Machina, or vice versa necessarily, there are reasons that you might want to watch Vox Machina before Mighty Nine. Just in terms of, not, not in a legitimate in-world sense, but in a meta sense from the understanding of the character journeys, not of the characters, but of the players. I think that's really interesting, and so for me... I think it's it's useful to to watch both uh, in order, but it's not necessary, and you can you can move away from it. Similarly, I think that right now the airing campaign, campaign three, is in a lot of ways a response to the Mighty Nine in some sense. Um, partly from Matt's side, because he seems to be trying to tell a much more sandboxy type of story, uh, as opposed to shoehorning them into a path and then watching them absolutely explode it. Because I feel like that happened. A bunch of times during Mighty Nine, I mean, geez, the number of times that they really fucked his plans over hard. Hooey! Hooey! No spoilers. But, um, but damn. Um, there, there are reasons, but do what you please. You can absolutely watch Mighty Nine without, without worrying about it. Uh, go do it. It's fucking awesome. You're gonna fall in love with Seb's character just as much as Scanlan, probably. He's amazing. They're all great. Jester is the bomb diggity dog. Um, I don't know, man. Laura's the, the coolest human being on the planet, I think. And that that's it. That's it. Uh, I'm excited for the rest of the show. Go watch D20 as well. Be still. You'll have fun. Okay, cool. Those are all the comments. We finally did it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Let me pull up the thing. Boom. And we're ready to go. So... We are going to watch episode 5 of Legend of Vox... I'm sorry. Episode 6 of Legend of Vox Machina. Last we left off, our wonderful adventuring party, our intrepid heroes, had ventured into Whitestone, the ancestral home of Percival von Musel Kowalski Dorolo III. Percival Frederickstein von Musel Kowalski Dorolo III. That's it. It's also spelled Klosowski, but it's Kowalski. Fucking, fucking Taliesin. Um, we've gone to his ancestral home and discovered, as he already knew, that it has been ravaged by the ravages of an evil vampire and his, um, sexy dom wife. Um, they're so hot. They're so fucking hot. They've always been the hottest villain characters and they continue to be the hottest villain characters and nobody can tell me otherwise. I think Ripley's hot too, but God! Delilah! Hey there, Delilah, what's it like in White Stone City? You're a fucking creepy necromancer. Do, 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 do. Holy shit. Um. Would volunteer to become undead slave? Maybe. Maybe. 
just maybe. Yeah, I might. Uh, sorry, weird aside. Um, yeah, no, they've been ravaging their town. Uh, killed his family, killed his sister, killed all his people, killed all his friends. And now he's got a gun with a bunch of names on it and he'd like some revenge. We also found the sun tree. We've talked about it a bunch in the discussion already, but... This is a hell of a moment in the campaign. This is like the moment in the campaign. The start moment of the campaign. There are a couple other other ones. You know, Uriel goes to give a speech and then some stuff happens. Or, you know, some other things occur and some stuff happens. There's some other moments in the campaign. But this one, the sun tree. The depiction of true, unadulterated evil for the sake of evil. The killing of all of these people just to send a message. It's horrifying. It's really, truly horrifying. And that is beautiful. It's beautiful. Ooh. It takes a level of genius to execute horror this way, and I think they executed it really well, and I really like it. And I think Matt executed it amazingly in campaign, and I think that they paid homage to that effectively in the show. Well freaking done, guys. Um, now we move on from there. We are in the middle of hostile territory. The unknown is all around us. There are enormous undead giants walking around. There are creepy creatures and scared civilians. We need a place to sleep because D&D characters need to rest. We need information and we need to start making moves now because the Briarwoods are going to find out that we're here immediately if they don't know already considering they put up a warning for us. For us. Um, and also it's implied that maybe they can see through ravens and crows and bats and things. So they probably know we're here already. It's pretty clear. So we got to hide. We got to have somewhere to sleep and we need to move and we need to make moves and we need to start killing vampires now. So let's see how our, our characters in our party makes that happen if they make that happen and how well it goes. There's also a particular sequence that I'm really hoping that we incorporate. That has to do with Vex, I'm sorry, with Vax and Scanlan. I'm just hoping for that. Anyway, just chatting that out. If you know, you know. If you don't, don't worry about it. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe we won't. I'll point it out if we do. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I've been talking for 20 minutes, so I'm going to do another sinky thing, which sucks, but I'm going to do a sinky thing just to make sure all my, my tracks are synced up, and then we'll come back and we'll actually start the episode. See you in a sec. Peace. Oh my god, T is so fucking good. Oh, it's finally just about drinkably warm, and it's so good. Ah, oh, God. Okay, Legend of Vox Machina, subtitles on, audio track, normal. Zero seconds, ready to go. There will be two ver- uh, No, actually, there won't. There will only be one version. It'll be the timer. It's up on YouTube. You can watch it. Beep, beep, timer to catch down. Let's go. No shilling for my stuff. You can find me on Patreon. That's it. Okay, bye. Uh, Whitestone map. Is that David Tennant again? Oi. Ah, the sign. The Dawn Father. Oh, he's a dwarf. The Kestrel. I see what we're doing. The joints. No! No! Aaron Yeager, where are you? Oh, yep. Archie! Ah, stone fell. No. Fuck off, man. None of that shit. We're gonna have fun. I had chocolate. I always hated chocolate. <clears throat> wow, got some gurgle there. It's the tea.
I just realized that in that image, Tr- Trinket is a little baby boy, and it's the cutest, sweetest. They really nailed that moment of a walk. It doesn't look like a real walk. It just looks cool. It's dope. Oh no. Oh yeah, they're aware. They'll know. We gotta walk away. Scary, scary. Hello, little children. Yummy crows. Get the fuck. Listen to the lady. Listen to the lady. Thank you, ma'am. Fuck that. Oh, they're all different. That's cool. Different beards, different hair. Symbols. They weren't. Oh, yeah. True. Yenin. Change. Oh, and Yenin is female. That's right. I forgot. That's a full change. Oh, that's a lot of attractive people. Mmm, empty platitudes. Yum, yum, yum. Um, 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 mm, I love filling my belly with air. Now, off to the dark work. Behind the scenes, Yenin. No. Not strangers, necessarily. Hail guard? Oh, yeah. Not to me. I think they should have done another take with that voice actress. Yeah, it do- that doesn't feel real. Yeah, this whole conversation doesn't work. Excuse me? Yeah. Fuck that. No, Scanlan's the fucking leader. No, it's super clear. It's not even a, a question. Scanlan is the leader of the group. Easy. Hard, hard win. You can make an argument for Vexalia, and that's it. But not right now. Scanlan's the leader right now. Oh, hi there. <laughs> Everything looks like shit, dude. A secret passage. There's a little gnat or mosquito in here. Sweet. <laughs> oh, 
also ale. <laughs> right. You will die. Yep. Rally the people. Well, the Kestrel. This is a whole new arc. Oh. Sun tree? Hey, Kiki. I mean, it'll take a while, but it won't. No. Yes. I'm a preacher. <laughs> That's what I do. And we could use a beret. Gonna need a beret. Yep, gonna need a beret. <laughs> Not here. Ooh, nice transition. Ziz, ziz. Welcome to the darkness. Oh, Ashley's so good. Ashley's so fucking good. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Step into the fire. Feel the burn. All right. This guy sucks. Say something badass, Archie. Shit. I got an idea who that is. The Castandra. Pfft. <laughs> He's going to drink it? Yeah. Hello, the Duke. He's a Goliath. Ow. Ow. That's solid body horror, but... Ugh. Oh no. True. True. This is great. <laughs> this is great. This is the best sequence. Perfect. Pfft, the giant dong. <laughs> Holy shit. Smash. Smart. Got it. Thinking with your dipstick. Thank you, Vax. Sure it would. Sure it would, Percy. If that shit doesn't fucking happen... Who? 
a one and a two and a three of us. Makana. <laughs> Makina. Oh boy. Archie. Is he eating normal food or is that human sausage? Human dick? Ugh. Gross. Uh. Ah, of course Percy's all sick with mechanical sights and stuff on his big guns. Bad news. We're doing this as a full heist. Team Backdoor, let's go. Wow, they made all these jokes in campaign three. That's so funny. Oh no, doors. Uh-oh, doors. Let's go, buddy. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see, Vax. We'll fucking see. Hey. I'd fall for that. I'd for sure fall for that. <laughs> Some of the hand scan, man. Just burn a fifth level spell on the door. It's no problem, dude. Don't take knock, whatever you do. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh. Looks like one team is doing much better than the other. <laughs> God damn it. Follow the plan. Well. Hey, Matt. Swing! <laughs> amazing. Good job. Well done. Y'all are amazing at this. You buy a chime of opening. Hi. Bye. Wow, they're really nailing the dagger back situation. It's so sick. And Vex grabbing her arrows. So sick. It's so sick. It's so cool. Hey, homies. Loyal ish. Asked and answered. Archie. Percy? I don't know how good I am with the tools anymore, but okay. <laughs> nope, I'm alive and so are you. Sweet. Who else is in this jail? Oh, Stonefell is here? Fuck, they got Scambo? He's fine, dude. He's got Dimension Door. He's out if he wants to be. AC needs to be able to sing. <laughs> Try. Ha. 
<laughs> nice. Quick illusion. Get him! Oh, is he just gonna lead them all off? Let's go, chick! Let's fucking go! Yeah, for Whitestone! It begins... Without any of the planning. Uh-oh. Ow! Ah! Brutal. Great way to show how much he doesn't care about his, uh, uh, inferiors. Sweet. Isn't there someone else in the jail? Oh boy. No, he's got you. No, no! I knew that was gonna happen as soon as she looked up at us. Fuck you, dude. Fuck you, show. Ooh, let's go, beast mode! Minxie! Rawr! Rawr! Ah, uh, and he gets away. Oh, Jesus. <gasps> Full keg. Full keg. Go, 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 go. Sick. Yeah, 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 yeah. This episode has been so much fun so far. Also feels hyper D&D. &D. No. I won't. Archie! Archie! Better to die this way. Let's go, Archie! One day. That'll do it! Jesus. He's on the list. He's on the list. Now that is the question. Archie, you're going to die for this. <laughs> Smoke? The mask. Fuck yeah! <laughs> Ooh. Oh, spooky! Let's fucking go! Blam blam! It's not gonna work. Oh, that makes this easier. Yeah, you don't even matter. Huh. Hey? What a cool flash. It's not gonna work though. He's he is vampire, right? Percy. Your soul is forfeit? Buddy. Buddy, pal. That killed the guy. I was just freaked out, dude. Bro. Kestrel still lives.
Oh, so sick. Fluffer Nutter! Wow. And thus the revolution begins. Sure do. Sure do. I guess. <laughs> Great reveal. So much has changed. So much is different. Oh, it's hard. To, it's hard to to break away from just like so much is different. It's all weird. It's still pretty fucking good though. Looking forward to talking through this episode. There was one element that I really didn't like. That I, that I thought actually really truly fell flat. And you'll, you probably know what it is. We'll talk about it though. It doesn't bring down the rest of the episode. It's not a horrible thing. But I want to talk about it. Chirp. A boom ba pow. Ooh. It's Whitestone. We're in Whitestone, everybody. Hey, uh, how does everybody feel about this episode? Because I feel like this was pretty interestingly paced and well put together. Um, and in all ways, kind of a lot of fun. Uh, there are some things that are up and down about it, but overall, it feels like a D&D game. The fighting feels awesome and way over the top. It keeps using that, like, ex extra gore, but it keeps instilling it mostly in, like, grog moments to, to just have him bring that to the party, which is exactly what he usually does. It's really cool. Okay, so this whole setup I don't love um, because it's not something that we should be seeing as characters. It sets up stuff going on in Whitestone. It sets up Archie, and that's fair, but we totally don't need it. And it could just be Keeper Yannon tells us that Archie's been captured, and that's the situation when we come into Whitestone. We don't have to set that up now, but... I understand why we're doing it. It's just... It's not necessary, actually. It really, really isn't necessary. It doesn't detract from anything, but it's not necessary. Okay. This guy doesn't seem to be a vampire, which is weird, because he's supposed to be a vampire. I don't know. Um, maybe he's a spawn. Maybe there's something else going on. He just... He seemed fine after getting shot, uh, or, or he seemed dead after getting shot a couple times, and that's not how vampire do. Um, I guess, I guess he's a spawn, which means that you can kill him that way. You don't have to go to his resting place. That actually makes sense. Um, okay. Man, this shit's still creepy. We should cut them down? No, we can't. So, I love this. I love this darkness, this moment. This is another moment where Keyleth gives Percy a look that's like, what the fuck, man? Why are you so cold? But Percy's being harsh and pragmatic in his own mind, and so it makes sense why he's doing what he's doing and why he's acting the way that he's acting. But from an outside perspective, it's harsh and cruel and a little bit of an indicator like a bit of a red flag right so that's pretty cool i think that that moment is great i think all the atmosphere of whitestone sort of jumping off of that comment we had earlier the fog the the feeling of everything the soundtrack the little kids running around playing with dead crows it's all fucking crazy um oh no we gotta move I love that the giants are all different and have different beards and hair and stuff. It makes them feel more real. They're also all giant un undead giants. These are giants that have been turned into dead giants. This is bad. <laughs> this is this is very bad. Um, and also very cool. Why are you wearing this thing? It's a part of the thing. Well, sweet. We gotta go find Keeper Yenin, and we do. We meet Keeper Yenin giving us a simple platitudinous speech about how a new day will dawn at some point. Just everyone chill out, don't fight back right now, which is of course why the Briarwoods will tolerate them, or the Pale Guard will, because she's telling them don't fight back right now, uh, it'll only make more smoke and make things worse, and they're down for that. But really, Yenin is working with the Resistance, because she knows they need the Resistance to be strong enough, and they need a spark, and they need something to ignite the fire, and of course, that's what we do by the end of the episode, both literally and metaphorically, is we light a fire in Whitestone. Um, and that's pretty fucking cool. It's, it's great. Okay, so everybody agrees. Can Yenin walks away. Greetings, stranger. And we get this. Dark Percy. Eyes shining. Goggles shining. 
keep Rihanna and tell me. Do the Briarwoods listen to your speeches? So there are a few things that are different here. The first is that in campaign, Keeper Yenon is an old man. And in campaign, we go and we seek out Keeper Yenon in Keeper Yenon's own sanctuary in their own, like, church area district thing. Shh, that name is forbidden. Pulls up the light. And I want to, I have to pull this up. I have to, we have to listen to it. I, I want to show you something. Here's my take. I think that voice acting, by and large, has been the strongest element of, or one of the strongest elements of Legend of Vox Machina all the way through. There's an obvious reason for that. All of the major players in this Dungeons & Dragons campaign are professional voice actors or voice directors or similar, right? All of them. All of them. Um, Liam O'Brien plays Gara. Matt Mercer plays all sorts of people. Um, th these people play all kinds of people. They're all incredible voice actors and they voice act their characters amazingly. And then the side characters who they get are, by and large, fantastic because they're, they know a bunch of cool voice actors who are really good and they bring them in. I don't know who this is, and I don't want to insult them, because I don't think that they're bad as a voice actress. However, I don't think their delivery of this set of lines fits. I don't think it works. I don't think it works at all. In fact, I, I, if I were in the position to have any say over it, I would simply ask for a retake with more emphasis on the surprise. Because let's set the scene here. Percival Frederickstein von Usel de Rollo, uh, Kowalski de Rollo III is fucking dead. He's dead to the world. Keeper Yenin knows him as dead. Thinks all of the Dorolos, except for Cassandra, perhaps, are dead. The, 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 the Briarwoods rule this city with an iron grip, and nobody is coming to help them. This man died as a child, never left the town, and has been dead ever since. He also is the... If, if he were to show up alive, he would be the representative and the spearhead of any hopes that Keeper Yenin has. And the reaction to meeting this character for the first time, seeing him in a dark alley, someone literally a ghost who this, this person does not believe is alive, is this? Shh. That name is forbidden. <gasps> it's you. It's you. Oh, but you're not. Oh, but you're not the same. The same. Little Percival. What have you become? I am what they made me. None of this works for me. It doesn't work for me. It just doesn't, it just did, it do not be working for me. I don't believe her. I don't believe that she is seeing a person that she has had, that's been lost to time for a decade. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. The reaction doesn't track. Now, maybe that's the writing of the lines. She puts a lot of, a lot of emphasis on it. There's a lot of, <gasps> A lot of, like, breathiness and emotion in the voice, but not in the way that the voice is working. Not in the, the things that are being said in the way that they're being said. There's no emotional impact. There's no, it takes time to process this new information. None of that occurs. It just, it doesn't feel real to me. It doesn't feel real to me. It's you. Oh, but you're not the same. See, it, I feel like maybe if it were like, oh, uh, uh, it's you. How? How can it? Like, like a moment of shock here, right? Like one moment of shock is all I really want. <gasps> it's you. It's you. And now we're just having a conversation. Oh, but you're not the same. What have they done to you? Little Percival, what have you become? I am. Is that your back? And then immediately the ramifications and all the... The importance of this situation is immediately clear to Yenin, and they just start talking as though they completely understand each other and are on the same page. It's fraught with with interpersonal narrative inconvenience. Um, the way these characters interact doesn't feel real. It feels like written characters. Because, and I will tell you why this is happening, because this interaction did not happen this way in the show. It wasn't an organic conversation. It was a written conversation, and it feels like one rough. That fucking sucks. I don't like this conversation. I think it sucks. I think it's a, a really pivotal moment in the episode, and it doesn't track. Does it bring down the rest of the episode immensely? No, but it happens early on, and it did irk me, and I saw I'm, I'm going to be honest about this thing that irked me, because it, it really did. All right. Uh, Dorolo can lead them to freedom, immediately all the things, but you're leading this group. Har har. Uh, right. We have a height requirement. Har har. And over to the tavern we go. I love the little whistle thing. I really like this character. Um, I like their character design, just sitting on a stoop, being a guy. It's pretty great. 
uh, Grog seeking out ale. What hell is this? Is super cute. The maps are great. This is the old hideout. We'll do all this stuff. Oh, Archie. And um, here's another example of a thing that I don't love. Um, this is not as bad. Their leader has been captured. Ah, there it is. He's set to be hanged tomorrow. It's Archibald Desne. Archie, but how? We used to be friends. Let me tell you all about Archie. This is a character giving exposition that, like, I get it. He, there's a reason for him to be giving this exposition. This is one step back from the worst kind of exposition, which is characters telling other characters things that those characters already know. That's the worst kind of exposition. You got two characters walking with each other, and they're like, at practice in soccer today, which you were at, coach told us to do big drills and stuff. And it's like, well, the other character knows that. Why are you having this fucking conversation? Fuck off. But this is one step away from that where you've got one character explaining to other characters and it's telling not showing but at least it's telling characters who have a reason to be told this and so we feel like we're not being just strung along by the show but it is still doing that thing and we have to recognize that under the surface it is still doing that thing regardless yeah even formed an alliance against my brother and looks away uh is a good moment though because you know brother and keyleth reaches out to the sun tree there's a little shift in the lighting in the room I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. There was like a little shift of some kind, but I, I guess I don't know. She reaches out to the sun tree and nothing happens. For the ale, I could get a beret. He will get a beret. He will fucking get a beret. And a great transition over to Pike stuff. The Pike stuff is also really cool. And I desperately, I want her to like move into the fire, right? The Everlight burns, so move into the fire. Come on. Well, maybe it's not a curse. Maybe it's something within you. Maybe it's your fear. Maybe it's something like that. So we move and we progress just a little bit. The way that they're weaving that in actually flows in a way that reminds me, this is odd, but it reminds me immensely of some of the episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender. It's a crazy thing to think, but like the Dragon Turtle episode where Aang ends up off on his own figuring something out and we're cutting back between him and like the other people and what they're doing. Stuff like, it feels kind of like that where you get this split up and, and like a spiritual journey in the course of things. Or even the, lep the episodes of Korra where she's trying to figure something deep and personal out as she goes out into the world alone and we're cutting between that and other things that kind of stuff or like when ang goes into the spirit world and we're going back and forth between there and elsewhere it feels like that it's that kind of a vibe and it's really cool okay and from there straight to the real world where torture is happening uh meet the duke vedmire uh he sucks he's a big scary guy and he rips ears off it's fucked up it's solid body horror i like it planning sequence this is really cute I don't know what to say beyond that. It's really cute. It's also kind of a jab at themselves because God, Vox Machina is so fucking bad at planning. Not that the Mighty Nine is necessarily better. Not that the new team is necessarily better. Not that any of these people, not that any D&D &D party is really good at plans, but holy shit, Vox Machina fucks plans up so bad, like so bad every time. They're so bad at planning. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and of course, you know, we talk about all these plans and then we go into the thing and it all explodes anyway. So it's reasonable, but at least talking it out is important and useful. And God, Vox Machina is so bad. So this jab at themselves is wonderful. The silly versions of the characters are wonderful and hilarious and lovely. And I love them. Um, also just this moment where he pop bong amazing and it's like a weird a uh, gnome dude and like two like a succubus chick or an, something and like a cat lady so a tabaxi a tiefling and a, a gnomish male just jumping on buff scanlan and his massive dong schlong amazing i also love grog just being like we killed them all what why is everyone arguing about this like come on it's easy all right, I got to tell you, I like this scope thing. It's pretty cool. We don't get to see the whole bad news yet, but clearly Talison put some effort into designing this thing because it's his little baby and he fucking loves it. Um, what's this? Oh, nothing but bad news. So fucking sick. Uh, just wait for it. 2D12. 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 Fuck you, Matt Mercy. You unbalanced, unbalanced weapons forever because of that shit, dude. Ah, 2D12. And then violent shot exists? Fuck off, man. Stop it, Matt. 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 Matthew. Sir Mercer. Monsieur Messer. Bro. 2D12. 2D12 at that range. 
I get it. You have to reload every attack. I understand. I understand why you did it. But it's 2d12, and then you give violent shot. It's not okay. It unbalances firearms. Now, you can say that firearms should be unbalanced, but all the rest of them aren't. Pistols are objectively worse than hand crossbows. Like, objectively. <laughs> Pepper boxes are not. Pepper boxes are strong. All of Matt Mercer's gunslinger is stronger than guns in the DMG. But, like, pistols are weaker than hand crossbows. Period. I'd rather have a hand crossbow. Except for the range. And then there's bad news. And bad news shifts everything. It shifts everything. Ugh. 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 And I mean, I guess if you combine firearm expert and gunner, you can get some cool stuff, and you can make them equivalent or slightly better than hand crossbows, but it's still... Still. Come on. All right. The door thing. Let's talk about the door thing. Those who don't know, doors are a problem for Vox Machina. They shouldn't be. They have a rogue. He has expertise in thieves' tools, as far as I know. He should be able to open pretty much any door. Man, they have so much trouble with doors. So much fucking trouble. So much trouble. They shoot doors, they hit doors with fucking 5th level spells, they do all sorts of shit. And it is the Keeper Yenon door that they do this to, it's just in a different place in a different time. But, wow. Just wow. Alright, welcome to the prison. All through the prison we go. Still working on the door, very funny. Get thrown piss on you, very funny. Great, great. Honestly, this is just Matt get bored. Matt got bored and was like, fuck it, you can come, come in the door, a guard walks out. I like this. A lot. The little flash of light effect, zoomp, zoomp, ting, super sick. It makes the, it, like, we've been consistent with showing Vax's ability to make daggers pop back to his blink pack belt, and it's really great. It's really, really cool, and it's one of the coolest things about his character. It's one of the things that people who watch Vox Machina are always like, I kind of want to build a Vax. Can I, can I make a flying rogue with lots of daggers, please? Um, yeah, you gotta have to invest a bunch of feats into it, but sure, why not? Also, techni technically, Sharpshooter doesn't work with thrown weapons, only weapons with the ranged property. So we shouldn't be able to do that, but whatever. Um, you could do it with darts. You could do it with darts. Check out the D4 D&D uh, &D optimized video, The Dart Thrower. Um, it's actually, it's an insane build, which is a fighter multiclass that only throws darts and deals an absurd amount of damage with one point damage darts because of Sharpshooter and, and stuff. It's it's nutty, uh, but also bonkers and wonderful. I like this little moment where we get Vex smiling and like, yeah, we've got a squad, and then everything goes to shit. It's pretty perfect. Hmm, something's wrong. Hello, Archie. We found the boy. Vax opens the thing. The bad guy shows up. He shows us the hammer. Uh, Scanlan makes a little sneak, which is very cute and very good, and I like it, and we start killing friends. It gets real bad. Um... Solidly brutal. I like the way that his underlings are expendable. I talk about this fairly frequently. The way that characters, villains, treat their underlings is an important indicator to us of how they'll treat the heroes. Um, we know this guy's ab ab abjectly, unstoppably evil. There's no dealing with this. The big thwale. Uh, it's a flail, not a thwale, but it, he goes thwack with it, so it's a thwale. Um, uh, bu -bu -bum. And this moment. So this is a sad setup. It's a good setup. I don't mind it. We've stuck with this character for the whole episode. This character's shown to have, like, a heart and to be a, a crucial leader of the revolution and is probably the second-in-command after Archibald. All of these things make them somewhat emotionally resonant to us. And so we get this moment where these two get together, they look up, we get this little smile, and you know immediately right here everything's going bad. Smash the knees, smash the skull. Clang, pow, boom, at least it was quick. And Keyleth goes fucking ape shit, or I guess kitty cat shit. Meow. And they do a really cool Animorphs transition here that I think is really rad in, in the moment. That's a really cool piece of animation, and I like it a lot. Um, yeah, Minxie going fighting, it doesn't work. Our, our, he runs away. Wait, we found booze, which ends up being crucial later, but it's also the keg of ale, so I, it shouldn't explode, but that's fine. More blood, more gore. More gore, more blood. More blood, more gore, and Percy. All right. Let's move it along to the Percy stuff. Plans don't go as planned all the time. The music. You know Talison chose this, right? Hurry, brother. <laughs> oh. 
I also think that Taliesin decided on that scene where he walks by a, an obfuscating piece of the architecture and the mask is just on and his eyes are gone. How fucking rad is that? Any uh, new watchers get any chills from that sequence? Because that's chill inducing. Hello? Oh. Vengeance for the Dorolos and his voice. For the Dorolos. Thanks, Talison. It's almost his uh, infernal, like, tongue voice, but not quite. I killed him because I wanted to. And I love how he just tells him, I don't even care about you. You just fucking suck. Running, 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 blam! Running, 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 blam. Blam, 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 blam. Oh, the eyes. Percy. <laughs> um... All black, everything, eyes. And points the gun at Vax. Uh-oh, what is wrong with you? And he starts yelling back. Oh boy. Hey, so, you know, you ever you ever see a friend and you see when they're lashing out at everybody around them? It's probably an indicator of deep inner turmoil and pain. And if you step back away from it and allow yourself to not be hurt by their flailing around, you'll realize that when they're lashing out at you, they're not actually trying to hurt you. They are just hurting. It's a really important realization to have in a friendship. Just shouting it out here. Just in case you ever see somebody act like Percy and get really fucking pissed about something and lash out at you as well, don't take it too personally. Just give them space. In this case, however, Percy's got some shit going on. He didn't just get angry and have his eyes turn black. There's weird smoke around him. His gun has names on it, and one of them burned off, and his eyes went full black. Though I don't think Vax saw that. Something is not right with Percival Dirolo. And as we move along, it may or may not become more clear what precisely is going on here. But there is definitely something afoot. And as he gets closer to his goal... As he gets closer to his vengeance, and as he achieves it and begins ticking names off his list, what kind of monster will this man become? That's the question, and I think that's the story that Taliesin wants and wanted and wants to tell with his character. And it's the story we're about to tell right now. How very fascinating. But there is one bit of beautiful hope. After all of this, also a big fireball scene, Fluffer Nutter shout out, super awesome. Fire burns. I have a sister. There's one bit of hope inside of Percy's heart, and you have to wonder what will happen to him if that hope is rejuvenated and then crushed once more. Because it seems like Cassandra is actively and intentionally working with the Briarwoods. And that's not very good. Cool. Nice episode. Couple things that I didn't like. I talked about them. Hopefully I've explained them effectively. They don't bring down the episode for me as a whole. I think the fighting is chaotic and brutal and, and funny in weird ways and really interesting. I think the whole setup is great. I think they're charging through the Whitestone arc really effectively. Um, there are some things that I'm really hoping don't get cut because, like... They shouldn't get cut. Um, and I think one of them has already been cut, so I'm going to mention it to you. There's a sequence where Scanlan and Vax go off and pretend to be father and son with disguise selves on and, like, disguises. And they go into a tavern and, like, try to talk people up. And it ends up with Scanlan as, like, a child, as pretending to be a child, like, chugging somebody's beer and talking to them about, like, becoming a part of the resistance and stuff. And it's just a really cool sequence and I really liked it. I understand why they might cut it because it's a lot of time and it doesn't really forward the plot, but it's so much fun. And I would recommend going and finding that sequence and at least watching that because it's a great shenanigan moment from Scanlan and uh, and Vax and I think it's really good. Okay, that's it I think for this episode of Legend of Vox Machina. Thank you everyone for watching along with me. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much or more than I have. If you weren't bugged by the things I was bugged by, that's dope and that's great. If you were enthused by things that I wasn't necessarily enthused by, please let me know in the comments. If you have any thoughts, comments, concerns, criticisms about the way that I do things, the way that they did things. 
let me know. Um, throw all that stuff in the comments. I will read them, and I may read them at the beginning of the next episode aloud to the rest of my audience. So if you want that to happen, you can you can do that, and I'll maybe read them. It'll be cool. Um, also, as always, if you'd like to support me on the Patreon and stuff, you can totally do that. It's the only way that I make money is through the generous donations of people like you. PBS. Uh, no, I am not public broadcasting, but kind of I am, honestly. I'm crowdfunded. It's what I do. Um, you can also check me out on the Instagram or the Twitch. I've been streaming Elden Ring recently, and it's been super fun. Um, check that out if you'd like to. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you wherever I see you, and whenever I see you, maybe that'll be just next week for the next episode of Legend of Vox Machina, and if so, then it will be perfect. I will see you when I see you. Thanks for watching. Peace.